Well, you know what? This is what happens when I say you can improv, so well done. <laughs> One final announcement. Uh, it is the start of a new month. It is also the start of Lent. But as it is the start of a new month, we have a new mission focus. Uh, Family Promise of Greater Indianapolis is our March mission focus here at St. Mark's. It's a nonprofit organization which helps homeless families work to get back on their feet. Homelessness increases the likelihood families will separate and children will fall behind in school and eventually drop out. And St. Mark's has been a longtime partner of IHN, that's the Interfaith Hospitality Network, the hallmark program of Family Promise. And while we are looking forward to hosting families again later this year, hopefully, Family Promise has three additional existing programs, which is the Apartment Shelter Program, the Aftercare Program, and Diversion Program, which continue to provide resources to help families restore their lives, find housing, and stay together. And that is something to absolutely rejoice. That is something we want to support. So financial donations may be given using a mission envelope or online at stmarkscarmel.org slash give. Uh, you can also scan one of the QR codes in your bulletin, or if you're here in person, you can scan one of the QR codes that um, should be on a card in your pew, and that will take you to the website to give, or there are the baskets at the back of the sanctuary. Because you give, St. Mark's gives, and we're able to be a church where mission is truly a way of life. So thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your attention. And now, let us continue to worship and praise. but through Christ in me. It's kind of a modern hymn. We're going to sing the first verse and then ask you to join us on the second uh, and following verses so that you can kind of hear the melody. During the season of Lent, we are reminded that we are reminded of our frailty. We are reminded of kind of the transient nature of our current existence. This Wednesday, we just celebrated Ash Wednesday, where we received ashes on our forehead to remind us of that. So in this season, let us remember that our true strength rely, lies in Jesus Christ, that our true hope is in Christ only. One gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is holy. been one 
to come before God. In the silence we offer you, O oh God, our deepest fears, our deepest gratitudes. God, we thank you that even in the darkest nights, And the storms howl, and the winds bellow, the joy comes in the morning, and your sunlight rises, and your hope is renewed, and our strength is regained in God, we thank you for walking us through the deepest valleys and for holding us on the top of mountains. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. upon the waters the great unknown where feet may fail 
And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed, and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the way. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper. Well, good morning. Good morning and hello once again. Oh, there we go. Good morning and hello one more time. I'm Pastor Julia Gonzalez, and it is a joy to be worshiping with you this morning, both in person and online, as we start and celebrate the first Sunday of Lent. As Ryan mentioned in the announcements, Lent is a time where we sometimes will. It is a season in the Christian calendar where we will sometimes give something up that keeps us away from God, or we will take something up that helps us draw closer to God. So this season, over the next few weeks as we prepare for Easter, we're going to be focusing in on what could be keeping us from God and what could be drawing us closer to God. And in line with that, we have a new sermon series, Reconcilable Differences. 
And I'm skipping out of order with the slides, and I'm sorry, Charlie. But you may notice that when we talk about reconcilable differences, there's an ear that's crossed out, an IR. When we've got an image where two good friends, you can see it's been torn apart, but then it's been brought back together. Because very often, especially lately, there have been feelings of, Lord, how can we possibly come together? How can we reconcile our differences? How can we say, well, I'm Republican or I'm Democrat and come together? How can we say I'm liberal or I'm conservative and come together? How can we see each other? And so often it feels impossible. And not just with politics, but even with fear and with faith, with hope. It feels like how can we come together? How can we reconcile these things? But not through, Christ, not through myself, not through us, but through Christ in us, it is possible. So we're going to be holding on to that. I want you to hold on to that, that differences can be reconciled. But it is a process, and it is a choice. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. I would invite you, if you are comfortable doing so, to please stand for the reading of the gospel lesson. So Jesus returned from the Jordan River after he had been baptized full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And there he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and afterward Jesus was starving. Nothing for 40 days, and he was hungry. The devil said to him, Since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, It's written, People won't live only by bread. So next the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said, I, I will give you domain, this whole domain and the glory of of all these kingdoms, it's been entrusted to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So the devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the temple, and he said to him, since you are God's son, really, if you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Jesus answered, it's been said, don't test the Lord your God. And after finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we have felt tested. We have felt tempted. We have felt uncertain. We have felt afraid and overwhelmed. We have also felt confident and assured. We felt joyful. But in your Son, we see the truth that you know what all of that is like, how hard it can be to hold all these things, to balance it all together, to face the tests and temptations, the uncertainties and doubts. In your justice, we find peace. In your grace, we find healing. And in your love, we find one another. Your son taught us to pray, the entire church saying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So deliver us from evil, God. Deliver us from evil and show us the way. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. The sermon title for today is Faith and Fear. And after the week I've had, I am suddenly reminded why I really need to be careful about what titles I give to my sermons. Because, you guys, it's been a week. Like, 
even with everything going on in the world, but also having a, my first tooth implant and being awake during that, like, I didn't like that. Or everything that's been happening in Ukraine, I really don't like that. Being wake, woken up at 3 a.m. for a tornado siren, you can imagine how much I liked that. I'm sure you felt something very similar if you're in Indiana, if you're in the Fishers area. I know we sometimes have people online who watch from far away, so you may not have had that experience, and God bless you in your sleep. You are so lucky. But it's been even more than just those moments of fear for me this week. My original plan was to talk about this after the fact, but certain events and spiritual prodding has led me to change that plan. So just indulge me for a moment for a bit of backstory and a bit of context. When I started at St. Mark's, I came to you as a local pastor. I had not yet been commissioned and made a provisional member of Indiana United Methodist Annual Conference. Uh, there's this whole process for ordination. There are steps upon steps, layers upon layers, and more paperwork than we should ever consider doing, but here we are. And I had the responsibility and privilege of being your pastor. I have that responsibility and privilege still. But I also believed, and I've always believed, that I was being called to ministry beyond that of a local pastor that I was being called to be fully ordained in the United Methodist Church. And there are some nitty-gritty differences between local pastors and ordained pastors, and if you want to talk about that, we can do that after the service. But there is a difference, and there's a lot of work that goes towards ordination. So I've been working towards that over the last few years while also serving you. And during the season of COVID, that was a lot sometimes, to be doing fruitfulness projects, to shifting from meeting in person with other would-be ordained pastors to suddenly meeting for, on Zoom for hours at a time. It's been an experience, and now on this coming Tuesday, I have completed all of my paperwork, and I have had it submitted, and on Tuesday, I have my interview that will determine if I am being ordained this year or not, and that is a huge relief. That is an answer to a call that I have felt for over 10 years, since I was in high school. But then on Thursday, I found this out on Friday, but on Thursday some events happen and suddenly it's like I'm already nervous about this ordination, about this ordination interview and everything that goes into it and everything leading up to it. And then suddenly it's announced that um, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church has been officially scheduled for 2024. There had been some hope that General Conference, which um, more or less in time, General Conference is the deciding body of the United Methodist Church. It meets every four years and it has representatives from every, um, from all over the world. This is a big deal, and there was some hope that it could be in the fall of 2022, but the realities for traveling and for different um, representatives and delegates getting visas to travel right now, it's just too much. And our laws, our bylaws as Methodists are not updated to allow us to meet on Zoom. That probably will be changed in 2024, but they've also got a lot of other stuff to talk about. But that means that some of the hard conversations, some of the hard conversations about sexuality and what we believe as, a, as an entire denomination, not just us as a church, but as an entire denomination, there is still some lack of resolve. There's still this waiting and this tension. And having to wait even longer, I suddenly found my news feed my social media feed, which I've, I've got a couple of pastors as friends, just, you know, 5, 10, 20. And a lot of them were posting, saying, okay, what comes next? What happens next? What does this mean for division in the church? What does this mean for, for us to be united? What does this mean for the future? And suddenly it's very clear to me, I have no idea what the future holds. Not that I ever did, 
But when I'm really reminded that in my face, that's scary. Like, I'm not ashamed to say that this week I have felt fear. I have felt so much uncertainty, so much doubt. But I have also felt so much faith and so much hope. Because while fear does exist, fear does not need to overcome faith. And fear, having fear doesn't mean that we are afraid. It means we're paying attention. It means we know that there are struggles around us, there are hardships around us. But by faith, we may not be overcome. And now you may be wondering, okay, we just read scriptures about the temptations of Jesus. There was no mention of being afraid. What does fear have to do with the temptation? Well, it's a question of what causes us to be tempted? What can lead to us giving in to temptation? When we read the scripture, when we hear about the ways in which Jesus was tempted, there are three very specific ways. There was the temptation to make bread, the temptation to become ruler over all the kingdoms of the world, and there was the temptation to prove that he was really God's son and that God really did love him. Now, growing up, um, when I was a child, I had a children's edition of the Bible, not the Spark Bible, sorry, um, and that translated some of the different stories of the Old Testament and ministry work of Jesus into something that an elementary student could understand, and it included pictures, which I used to enjoy having pictures in the books. Sometimes I still do. But I still remember, I, I bring this up because I can still remember the picture that was in this children's Bible as it tells the story of Jesus being tempted. And Jesus just takes this stance. His arms are crossed, his back is turned, and it's just, get away from me, devil. It takes a lot um, from the Matthew account. Not so much from the Luke account, but the Matthew account of this temptation. And I grew up thinking, oh, Jesus is just so brave. Jesus never felt afraid. Jesus never felt uncertain. Jesus wasn't really tempted. He always knew for certain what was going on. But then, as it often happens, you come back to the scriptures as an adult, and suddenly it's, was he really? Was he really not tempted by that? Because it says he was tempted. It says that he was hungry, that he had gone 40 days without food. And how many of us have ever in our lives experienced a moment where we thought, Lord, I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to pay for my child's meal. Maybe in this congregation there haven't been, there haven't been too many times of feeling that or thinking that, but we know that that exists in the world. We know others have experienced that thought, that fear. And when you're that hungry, and when you're also thinking, how am I going to feed the people who depend on me? Suddenly, that's where temptation can come in. Because you're afraid of what may happen, you can be tempted to do all sorts of things to take care of the people around you, to take care of yourself. But Jesus remembered that God is faithful. And that wasn't just because he was part of, he was and is part of God. It's because there have been stories of God's faithfulness throughout the generations, throughout stories upon stories in the Bible. But especially, as Jonathan reminded me this week, there's the story of how they were wandering, the Israelites were wandering in the desert, and they were so hungry, and they prayed, and they complained, and then they prayed some more. And God provided manna and quail. God provided bread and meat. God provided food. God didn't shame them for being hungry or for being afraid about where their next meal would come. God understood. And then we have the second temptation where it's, look at all this land, look at all these kingdoms, look at all this power, and if you worship me, I'll give it to you. Well, that's a reminder of the promises that God made to the people of Israel again, that covenant that I will give you a land, I will give you a kingdom, I will give you a home. 
But it also speaks to even later in the gospel when Jesus is facing the trials of the cross and there is this night in the garden where he says, Lord, if possible, take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. But not my will, but thine be done. He had an easy way out of, well, if I just worship the devil, then I can take, you know, I don't have to deal with all of the stress. I don't have to end up on the cross. I don't have to face all this struggle. I can just succeed and be done and safe, and it's fine. But he knew that's not how it works. He knew that wasn't right. So get away from me, devil. No, I only worship the Lord our God. And then there's the final temptation. If you're really God's son, throw yourself down and see if he catches you. How many of us, not just with God, but even with other people in our lives, how many of us have ever had that moment of wondering, do they really love me? If I fall, can I rely on them to catch me? If I need to talk, will they be there? Can I trust them with all of my doubts and all of my uncertainties? Can I rely on their love? And can I rely on God's love? Can I believe that God really loves me, especially when God can feel so far away and so silent in a world that's filled with so many noises and distractions, as our youth reminded us last week? There is so much going on. And it can be so easy to feel afraid. And in that fear, think, maybe God doesn't really love me that much. Maybe I've done enough stuff wrong that God doesn't love me anymore. But Jesus knew the truth. Jesus knew the truth without a shadow of a doubt that God's love is infinite. That God's love is strong and sustaining that it is not a weak or fragile thing, but that it stands firm and that we can not only rely on it and hold on to it, but we can also find shelter, shelter from the storm beneath the wings of God's love. How many of us need to be reminded sometimes that no matter what we do, no matter what we're afraid of, no matter whether we give in to temptation or not, that God still loves us? What a blessing that is. What a blessing it is to feel and to know that though we may be afraid, fear does not need to be the end of the story. Fear has never been the end of the story. Fear has never been meant to overwhelm or overcome, but rather faith and love is what is meant to overcome. That the trials that we face, the temptations, the fears, the doubts, that God truly understands, that God does not shame us for this, but that rather when we experience this and when we go to God saying, Lord, I am afraid of the future. I am afraid of this interview. I am afraid of this violence in Ukraine. I am afraid of this tornado. I am afraid of this procedure. I am afraid of this fight in my family. I am afraid of all of these things. God catches us. In the face of all the fear, God says, I'm here. I've got this. I've got you. You are not alone. You do not have to face this struggle alone. The fear may come. The sorrow may last through the night. But with the rising of the sun, in, many, in more than just one way, love overcomes and joy is found. So let our fear and our faith be reconciled with one another. We may be afraid because we see the world around us and we feel the uncertainty, but may you feel, may you find that even greater than your fear is your faith. May your faith, your trust, and your love be greater than your fear. And may you remember that God understands and is there. Would you please pray with me? 
Holy and loving God, we remember that you are with us, that your fear is a steadfast and strong assurance. We remember that you sent your Son to die for us, to live for us, to save us, and that that's part of the proof of your love, that in the end, fear does not win, but faith and love overcome. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for this reminder. Thank you for this promise that we may find reconciliation, that we may find peace, and we may be found in you. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Today, as another way of celebrating the ways in which God's love is steadfast and strong and comes to us in many different ways, we are celebrating the sacrament of communion. This is a holy tradition, one that has been passed down through the generations as a way of remembering that God loves us and that Christ is, only, is always with us. So at this time, if you are um, watching online, you are invited to go and get um, bread or juice, bread and juice, or elements that might um, bring to mind that. And for those who are in the sanctuary, you should have received a communion cup that has a small wafer and a bit of juice. If you have not received that yet, please raise your hand and an usher will come and serve you. But let us remember that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, on the night when he had so much to fear, rather than be fearful, he took the time to sit down and share a meal with his disciples, to remind them of how much he loved them. And as part of the supper, he took bread and he gave thanks to God. He blessed the bread, praised God, and then broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Know that I am with you always. And then when the supper was over, Jesus took up the cup and he, that was filled with wine, and he again gave thanks to God. He praised God for, his, for God's steadfast love and presence, and then he passed it around the table to the disciples, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood poured out for you for the, for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and know that you are forgiven know that you are loved. And so it is at the start of every month in the United Methodist Church, we celebrate communion. We celebrate this holy sacrament, this reminder that God is always with us and that Christ is in us. Christ is in us and loving us. So we take these elements and we eat and we remember and we ask for forgiveness for our fears. So Lord, in this holy mystery, in this uncertainty, we give thanks to you, and we bless the bread, we eat, and we remember you, and we drink from the cup, we bless the cup, we give thanks to you for all you have done, and we drink and we remember We do these things as a sign of Christ's love for us, as a sign of Christ's enduring presence. And we remember that even if you're not United Methodist, we celebrate this as an open table. All are welcome to take part in communion. All are welcome to take part in God's love. You don't need to be a professing member of the church or a United Methodist. You just need to let your faith overcome your fear. So for these gifts, for these blessings, for this remembrance, Lord, we give thanks to you. We confess the times where we have fallen to fear and temptation. We confess the times where we have failed. And we confess that we believe in your love, that we believe in your redemption, your the salvation and forgiveness. Though we have fallen, though we have felt fear, May our faith be even greater 
and may we rest in your unending love. In the name of your Son, we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Today, Lord, we give thanks for your sweet mercy that comes to us faithfully and new every day. And as we go forth from worship, as we go forth and enter the world, we enter your gates with thanksgiving, remembering that your mercy is sure, your love is steadfast, and that your gifts are great. We hold on to our faith, we turn to you in our fear, and we welcome others in love. In all these things, Lord, we give thanks and praise you. Amen. May you go in peace. For the glory of the risen